Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm David Brewweiler, and I'm going to be talking today about using SRW and Serepo to calculate X-ray brightness from undulators. So my outline here is to first motivate the presentation, then talk about undulator brightness as a figure of merit for synchrotron light sources. I'll mention the publications that this work is based on and acknowledge our funding source. Uh, I'll give you a very brief overview of SRW, which stands for Synchrotron Radiation Workshop. That's the code that's being used in SREPO here. I'll uh, describe how you calculate brightness for uh, undulator uh, radiation. And then I will talk specifically about how that's done uh, in a more generalized way with SREPO SRW. Then there'll be a short demo and then we'll move to the Q&A. So the motivation, uh, undulator brightness is a fundamental figure of merit for synchrotron light sources around the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. Uh, compact free electron lasers or FELs uh, with novel undulators may emerge as fifth generation light sources in the future. If so, synchrotron radiation is gonna be very important uh, during the development and uh, commissioning of such light sources. Uh, diagnostics for ultra short high brightness electron bunches is a challenge that's emerging as uh, the particle accelerator community produces ever shorter and ever brighter electron bunches. And uh, using undulator synchrotron radiation is one important approach for diagnosing these beams. A significant aspect of, uh, of the value proposition here is community outreach. So as many of you may know, synchrotron light sources are really important engines for scientific productivity around the world. And there's quite a few of them in, in a, every region of the world. Um, they're used for materials science, for biology, for chemistry and more uh, with applications ranging from basic science to medicine to industry. And uh, use and understanding of light sources is, is therefore important for the developing world. And so that's why we'd like to emphasize that Serepo.com is a free scientific gateway for the world. And so anyone with an internet connection has full access to the capabilities that I'm gonna be presenting here. And um, yeah. So undulator brightness is a figure of merit. Um, if you look at the figure here on this uh, slide, you can see uh, a number of light sources are called out and we're plotting brightness on the vertical scale versus uh, photon energy on the horizontal scale ranging from one to 100. In red, we have the APS or advanced photon source from argon. And uh, APS today is referencing sort of APS parameters prior to the recent shutdown. And the APS upgrade is um, what is hoped uh, the community hopes to achieve when the upgrade uh, that's under construction right now is completed and commissioned. And so the point here is that, you know, the brightness is going to increase by two orders of magnitude. A uh, similar story for ALS in the blue lines, that's the advanced light source at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, solid is the present day operations and dashed is what's anticipated for the proposed upgrade, which hopefully will come online in a few years. In black here, you see uh, the plot for the National Synchrotron Light Source, NSLS-2 at Brookhaven National Lab, which uh, is the most modern synchrotron light source operating right now in the United States. And then green is the SSRL, which is uh, at SLAC at Stanford. So, so the point is that, uh, you know, for both for proposed uh, synchrotrons and for operating synchrotrons, these brightness curves are being uh, calculated and presented. And so it's, it's both a scientific uh, figure of merit and it's to a certain extent a political uh, quantity. And so it should be well understood and calculated correctly. And, and many, you know, it's not easy to calculate. It's uh, and not that many people are able to calculate it correctly. And so uh, what we're providing here through Serepo is a way um, for more scientists to have access to such calculations. Um, yeah, and, and it's also important to note that some of the published and widely used formulas are making strong assumptions and we, we call that out today. And so you should be aware of that. So the two most relevant publications um, 
in regard to what I'm presenting today are these by Boaz Nash et al. Um, the third one here by Maxime Rakitin et al. is uh, an, in an interesting description of Serepo and the client server aspects of Serepo where you have a browser-based GUI and then you have a physics code uh, running in a application container in the cloud. Uh, some of the details uh, in this paper from 2018 are a, a little out of date because Repo is constantly developing and evolving, but it's a very good uh, description of the, of the basic architecture. And we'd like to thank the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science, Office of Basic Energy Sciences for supporting this work. So SRW, Synchrotron Radiation Workshop. This is a physical optics code. It's a state-of-the-art code for calculating synchrotron radiation emission and also for calculating wavefront propagation, in particular for X-ray optics with a lot of um, capabilities for detailed uh, and accurate treatment of, uh, of many X-ray optics uh, elements. Uh, so the SRW was based uh, on work that was published in 1997 by BART um, for, and, uh, and there was an associated code called phase. Uh, in that year and the following year, um, Pascal Elom and Oleg Chubar and collaborators um, developed SRW. It was written in C++. The original interface was to Igor Pro, which is a commercial software application. And compiled versions are still distributed from the ESRF website. ESRF is a synchrotron light source in France. And uh, then some, you know, so it's been actively used and developed since the late 90s. Um, in 2012, uh, with, uh, with uh, support from ESRF, the European X-ray FEL, the Soleil Synchrotron, the Diamond Light Source in England, the US Department of Energy and Brookhaven National Lab, the uh, source code for SRW was released on GitHub with an open source license. So you can go to github.com slash ochubar slash SRW uh, to get the full source code. And Oleg Chubar of Brookhaven National Laboratory is the primary developer and supporter of the code. So there's also um, a Python API, rather sophisticated Python API that's been developed for SRW. Um, what Srepo brings is a, a GUI so you can use SRW through your browser uh, without having to learn the Python API or by Igor Pro or other, find other ways of using the code. So you just go to www.srepo.com, click on supported codes, select SRW and you're on your way. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the physics of undulator radiation. Here's a schematic slide to sort of orient everybody. If you look down here in the lower left, this is a planar undulator, which consists of a sequence of um, magnetic fields all alternating between north and south. And then you have a relativistic electron uh, beam coming down the axis of this undulator. And under the influence of these magnetic fields, it's oscillating horizontally back and forth, and it's emitting partially coherent synchrotron radiation in the process. So now if you look at this, uh, sort of trajectory here, uh, this blue line that's kind of wiggling around, we're assuming that this is the trajectory of a relativistic electron. And every time that electron changes direction, it's going to emit synchrotron radiation. And that radiation is going to be emitted primarily in a direction tangent to the local uh, trajectory. And so using Leonard Vickard potentials and formulas that can be obtained in standard electromagnetic textbooks, uh, you can calculate the electric field as a function of position and frequency um, by doing appropriate integrals along the trajectory. Down here in the lower right, we have a nice photograph of an undulator at ESRF. So how do we get from radiation wavefronts to photon flux? So um, SRW is a physical optics code where we're a calculating electric fields on a mesh and we're using Fourier transforms. So there's no actual photons here. This is all classical electromagnetics. Um, and the radiation that you would calculate from a filament beam propagating along an axis, uh, along a trajectory down the axis of an undulator is going to be very um, uh, 
coherent. Um, and, and the integral looks like this, where you take the norm of the electric field uh, from our calculation on the previous slide. And uh, if you want to include the energy distribution of the electron beam, the energy spread, and you assume it's Gaussian, you would throw in this factor and, and can do a convolution uh, in your integral over that uh, distribution in electron energies. And then you have some standard physical factors out front, uh, the peak, uh, the peak current of the beam, um, the parameter alpha is one over 37, speed of light, charge of the electron. And what you get is the number of photons um, emitted per unit time, per unit frequency interval, um, and then per volume. So uh, the photon uh, beam size and divergence are also very important quantities in addition to the flux. And uh, here, this phi one is, you can see just an integral over the phi sub R one above. So it's a volume integral over this quantity. And then that's a normalizing factor, which can be used to get the, the size and the here in this equation, and then the divergence here in the lower equation associated with this uh, generated photon beam. And this is all calculated at the source, which is a somewhat vaguely defined quantity, but it's more or less in the center of the undulator. So what, what uh, Oleg Chubar developed for uh, SRW some years ago was a generalized computation of the photon flux shown here inside of the outline box. And uh, the two 2019 papers by Nash et al. is giving you uh, a lot of the details of that calculation, which were not previously available. So this C naught is a, uh, you know, the fine structure constant times the frequency interval uh, over the classical, over this charge of the electron. And then uh, there's a convention that we use here that's relatively common, which is that uh, when we talk about frequency bandwidth, we're, we're usually talking about 0.1%. Uh, um, this, now you, I don't expect you to like uh, fully understand all of, all of these uh, mathematics and these complicated uh, formulas, but it, you can read the papers for the details, but it, it's, I think it's important just to, to understand that there's a significant um, complexity here. So you look in the formula, um, this double J super bar squared, that is a, a combination of Bessel functions. Here, the K1 and the K2 are generalizations of the uh, well-known undulator strength parameter, usually written as a capital K. And that's because we are considering elliptical undulators. And then uh, we have two um, special factors, a G, a G function and an F function. G is an analytic function. Uh, F is a double integral, which um, is not convenient to calculate. And so in, S, in SREPO, we, we have pre-calculated it um, for you. Um, so in, in any case, you have this rather complicated expression. Now, those of you who are familiar with uh, photon brightness calculations may be thinking of the classic 1986 paper by Kwon Ji Kim, uh, which has this form shown in the lower right inside of the yellow box here. And um, this, if you start with the generalized computation and you make three restrictive assumptions, you will recover the Kwon Ji Kim brightness. That is, uh, rather than an elliptic undulator, you assume a planar undulator, you assume no energy spread in the electron beam, and you assume no uh, deviation from the from the harmonic resonance, and then you'll recover this earlier formula. But uh, these generalizations are all very important to capture in, in the real world. So uh, continuing here with the generalized computation of the photon flux, we have this equation for the generalized or you so-called universal function F from the previous slide. Here, capital delta is a shown down here in the lower left, it's a normalized uh, different deviation from the, um, the harmonic energy. And then the epsilon is a, is a normalized um, energy spread of the electron beam. In, the, in these formulas, the lowercase n is your harmonic number and the large n is the number of periods in the undulator. 
And uh, this sink squared you see in the function up here at the top, that's related to the natural shape of undulator radiation, which you'll see uh, in the demo. And uh, it is worth noting that back in 2009, Tanaka and Kitamura published uh, a generalization that includes the uh, energy spread of the electron beam, but they did not include uh, deviation from energy. So if we assume uh, no detuning, uh, we, the formulas here are consistent with uh, Tanaka and Kitamura. So if you look at this uh, color contour plot of the photon flux, and you look at the center of the horizontal axis where capital delta is indicated to be zero, you can see over here on the right in this uh, color map that that corresponds to about 1.565. And um, that's just a, a normal, uh, you know, a constant factor in, in, in front of the flux calculation. If you detune to lower energies from, the, from this resonant energy, um, what you find is that um, you get to the peak of the red, which is a factor of two larger. So there's actually the peak flux is uh, goes up by a factor of two as you go down in energy just slightly below the resonance. As you go up in energy just uh, above the resonance, uh, the flux very quickly drops to zero. And if you go vertically upward on this uh, plot, uh, you'll see this is increasing the energy spread of the electron bunch. And as expected, um, it just indicates a, a, can, a monotonic decrease of the, of the photon flux. Okay, so finally, let's calculate brightness. Um, brightness is a, an approximate concept and it's defined at the source location. It requires approximate values for the convolved size and divergence of the electron and photon beams. So the formula is here in the upper right, brightness is the photon flux divided by four pi squared times these two uh, generalized emittances, the horizontal and the vertical generalized emittance. And then these are, um, written as the product of these capital sigmas, which are uh, defined below. So basically uh, you need to know the photon beam size, which um, is written here in the left side of this first equation. And that uh, has a standard form related to the square root of the wavelength of the, uh, of the harmonic that you're interested in. And then times a, another version of these uh, pre-calculated uh, universal functions. And then for the photon beam divergence, it's the same story. Um, and if you look at these two pretty plots down here on the lower right, these are analogous to what I was showing you on the previous slide, but instead of talking about photon flux, we're talking about the, the photon beam size on the left and the photon beam divergence on the right. And so you can see how those quantities are varying um, in magnitude as a function of this normalized uh, energy divergence and electron beam energy spread. And then what you see down here on the lower left in these equations is that these capital sigmas are just uh, the RMS uh, size of the electron beam and the resulting photon beam added in quadrature. And then these X primes are indicating uh, divergence. And so again, this capital sigma sub X prime or or Y prime is, this, is the sum and quadrature of these RMS sizes of the electron beam divergence and the photon beam divergence at the source. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a demo. So you go to your browser, any modern browser on any operating system and you type srepo.com and you get to the Srepo homepage click on supported codes, you scroll down here to SRW. And uh, if you've never logged in to Serepo, you're gonna get challenged with an email-based uh, login process. It's very simple to follow. Um, once you're logged in, uh, you can log in in the same way from any browser on any computer and you have your own uh, workspace that you can use. And this is, this is all uh, free. You don't have to pay unless you want more computing resources. So uh, for SRW here, I'm gonna go down into the directory with some uh, built-in examples. We can make this welcome go away. I'm gonna look at this ellipsoidal undulator example. So I'll double -click, I can double click on it or I can choose to open it as a new copy. So it immediately begins to do some calculations for me, uh, which take a couple of minutes, some of them. 
While it's doing that, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. So up here in the upper left, you see uh, uh, an input report for the electron beam. Click on the pencil here. And uh, you can see I've chosen an existing beam, the so-called NSLS2 low beta final. And there's a number of other uh, pre-calculated electron beams from light sources around the world. And of course, you can start with one of these and then you can change it, um, or you can just input your own um, favorite uh, beam parameters. Uh, you can see here, it's a three GeV electron beam uh, with a peak current of 0.5 amps, an RMS energy spread of a bit less than 10 to the minus three. And then down here, you see the twist parameters where the horizontal emittance is quite a bit larger than the vertical emittance. And that's because in most synchrotrons, uh, the horizontal emittance is larger due to uh, effects related to the dispersion in the dipoles, uh, beta parameters, and so on. You can go over to the position tab by clicking on this up here in the upper left. And here you see the horizontal and vertical positions and angles have all been set to zero. So this is a beam that's going right down the axis of the undulator, but you can choose it to be off axis. And this drift of minus one meters that's pre-calculated for you, that just makes sure that the electron beam is starting to the left of the undulator and propagating all the way through the undulator to calculate the radiation. So here uh, we have an idealized undulator. It's actually, it's possible to upload uh, tabulated undulator uh, magnetic fields if you need to do that. But um, today we'll just work with an idealized case. Here you see the parameters that have been put in 49 millimeter uh, period for the magnetic field oscillations, two meters, almost two meters uh, in total length. And then the central position is set to be at zero. The effective deflecting parameter is 2.7. And this is related to the magnetic fields along the two axes. So you can note here that the horizontal magnetic field is 0.2 Tesla, whereas the vertical is closer to 0.6. So it's a stronger in the vertical direction. And here you can specify the symmetry of both the horizontal and uh, vertical fields there. So I'm gonna go ahead and X out of here, not making any changes. So when you're doing um, an SRW simulation, often the first uh, report you wanna look at is this one here, the so-called single electron spectrum. It calls out that this is at a location of 20 meters uh, from the source. Uh, when you're looking at output from SRW, it's always very specific about uh, how far are you from the source, what energy or energy range is under consideration, and often what um, transverse area is, is being um, considered uh, for the radiation. So what you see here are the odd harmonics. Um, here's the first harmonic and then the third harmonic at three times the energy, fifth and seventh. Uh, if you click, you can click anywhere on here uh, and you see it grabs the nearest data point and tells you about it. If you click near the peak, it defaults to going to the, the top of the peak tells you the photon energy associated with that peak is 365 electron volts. The uh, corresponding intensity in units of photons per second per 0.1% energy bandwidth per square millimeter is eight times 10 to the 14. And it also notes that um, this is a local maximum and it automatically calculates for you the full width half max of the distribution around that local maximum. So when we're looking at uh, SRW output, we need to know what is the energy we're looking at. And so if you want to know what's going on with the first harmonic, you need to remember that that first harmonic is at 365 EV. So the next uh, figure that can be useful to look at is this flux through finite aperture. Here we have, again, the, the odd harmonics, one, three, five, and seven with approximately the same relative amplitudes we saw previously. But now we're integrating over a specified transverse area. And when you do that, you find that you also have uh, some amount of uh, energy coming from the, from the even harmonics. If we uh, click on the, on, the on the pencil here, here, this, uh, the, the flux is uh, integrating over energy. So this is, uh, well, no, actually, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a, no, it's a range of energies. But um, again, we're 20 meters away. 
And then the other point I wanted to uh, emphasize here is that the aperture size is is very clear, you know, specifically noted to be one millimeter uh, horizontal and vertical. If you change that aperture size, you're going to, of course, change the results. And you can also look off axis if you want to see um, what is the spectral uh, flux off axis. So here on the right is the power density. That is uh, that is data that's corresponding to all available energies. And so if you at a mirror, for example, you would you would uh, look at this to see what was the power density on your mirror at various positions. So another um, this intensity plot over here on the left, um, it looks a little odd, but you can see here that it's it's at one thousand uh, and ninety eV. Whereas if we go back here, we can remind ourselves that the the first harmonic is at three hundred and sixty five eV. Um, so this doesn't sort of look like what you might expect a spot to look like, but if we go uh, click on the pencil, we can change the energy to 365. And we can also, we can choose uh, which polarization you wanna look at. Uh, we can also choose if it's, you wanna look at the single electron intensity, the multi-electron intensity disregarding energy spread and, and other quantities, including uh, electric field phases and so on. I'm gonna also just uh, go ahead and double the size of the of our virtual detector here. So I, when I save out, uh, as Serepo notes that some changes were made and it recalculates, so here you see your sink squared function that uh, was used in the integral I showed you in my presentation. And uh, it looks like a nice spot. And um, yeah, so that's sort of, that's the, that's the spot size um, at the source. Another interesting thing you get from SRW here is a pre-calculation of the electron trajectory. Blue is the horizontal position and orange is the vertical position. The horizontal excursions are larger because the vertical undulator field is larger. And uh, due to how the magnetic field affects the electron beam, vertical field gives you horizontal excursions. And, but you have excursions in both planes because it is a helical undulator. Because it's an ideal undulator, a, a beam coming in, an electron coming in on axis leaves perfectly on, on axis as well. That's not going to be true in general for the tabulated undulator fields. Okay, so finally, this is the last report I'm going to show you. It's the brightness report. And what you see here is the so-called K tuning report, where K is the undulator um, strength parameter. And this is imagining how things change as you change the strength of the undulator. And, and that can be realized in a physical system often by uh, increasing, the increasing or decreasing the gap between the magnets, um, which is one way of changing the strength. And you see the first, second, and third harmonics here. I'll go ahead and click on the pencil. And other than the K-tuning, the other major way of looking at uh, this kind of detuning effects is the spectral detuning. Here it's defaulting to the fifth harmonic. I'll change it to the first harmonic. And uh, we can look at the flux. Um, we can also look at the brilliance, which is es essentially the brightness. I'll save the changes here. And so what you see Remember at 365 eV, that's the resonant, resonant energy of the first harmonic. And we go up here and uh, it's uh, the brightness here is six times 10 to the 19. As you go down, detune below the resonant energy, the brightness actually goes up and then it rolls over. As you go above the resonant energy, the, the brightness is, is dropping quite rapidly. Um, I'll stop my demo there. I'll, just go back for one more slide in my presentation. Okay, so this is uh, an important point. What I was what I was showing you in that brightness report is a, essentially an analytic or semi-analytic calculation based on uh, all the formulas I, I showed you earlier in the presentation. It's you can get this information directly from SRW. Uh, or any other 
uh, physical optics code with the appropriate capabilities, but you have to work pretty hard to get that information. And so what we show here is a, a code validation exercise um, comparing SRW uh, sort of, you know, brute force uh, explicit calculations shown here uh, in the blue dots versus the analytic uh, calculations um, coming that you get uh, automatically or very easily from the brightness report that I just showed in the demo. And so what you see here is the first harmonic, the third and the fifth harmonic. Excellent agreement for the first harmonic. As you go to higher harmonics, the agreement is less good, but it's still pretty reasonable. But it, it's good to remember that this is a this is a, an approximate uh, calculation that you're getting out of that brightness report. And here we see in the spectral detuning plot, this factor of two in the flux increase uh, as you detune slightly below the resonant energy. And that, that's a factor of two that shows up occasionally in the literature without um, always a great explanation. So I'm gonna stop there and answer any questions. And uh, it's also, feel free to contact me or, or Boaz uh, afterwards. All right, thanks, David, that was excellent. Um, we'll start with our Q&A session. If uh, any of the attendees have a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to those. Um, to start out with, our first question is, what's the difference between SRW and the code shadow? Yeah, so shadow is another sort of premier and widely used X-ray optics code um, in the community. It's also, um, distributed um, open source. Um, it, Shadow is using ray tracing techniques. It's, it's not a physical optics code. It's a ray tracing code, which is essentially geometric optics. And um, therefore uh, there's an implicit assumption that the radiation is completely incoherent. Uh, and you can get, it can be interesting to look at both SRW and Shadow. You, you get very different information out of them. and and uh, you have to remember that uh, what I was showing you from SRW was mostly um, perfectly coherent results, which are also an approximation in the other direction. You can get partially coherent results out of SRW if you work a little harder at it. But in, in any case, as you, for many uh, beam lines uh, at existing light sources, um, uh, this incoherent assumption is okay, but for emerging, uh, light sources, the, the X-ray beams are becoming more and more coherent. And so um, you really have to use SRW to model those accurately. Excellent, thank you. Uh, our next question uh, comes to us. And it's, where do the web browser version of SRW calculations take place? Are the calculations taking place on your servers or are they taking place in my browser? So SRW is executing on our servers. Um, we have, uh, we use Docker, which is a sort of widely used open source uh, technology for uh, containerizing applications. And so basically it runs on Linux in an environment uh, defined by Docker where you have everything you need to run it um, and nothing else. And uh, yes, and so it, what's happening in your browser is all of the, the interactive visualization, but. All right, thank you very much. Um, our next question in, uh, in line is, what if I want to work with SRW on the command line? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, let me go back to the demo. So um, when you're in a, Repo simulation, you can go up to the cogwheel here in the upper right and click on that. And then you have an, op an option to export uh, the Python source. So as I answered the previous question, uh, what's happening is, on a, is happening on a Linux server in the cloud, um, pretty much, uh, you know, we're using the Python API for SRW on that server. And so basically, uh, the, one of the philosophies of, of uh, Serepo is we don't lock you into the GUI. You do as much as you want with the GUI, and then 
you move to the command line and go into expert mode whenever you like. This also is a great way for code experts to work with um, new people, students or, or busy people who are not gonna work with the Python API. So in any case, uh, you, uh, but sometimes there's other uh, files associated with it. And if you click export as zip, then you're gonna get a zip file that has the Python source and all the other you know, mirror files or whatever else uh, was uploaded into the GUI and, and, and is being actively used. So now once you can now take that zip file and you can go to your own environment, whether it's Windows or Linux or something else where you're running SRW and you can uh, start using it there. You can also uh, use our the Radiosoft Jupyter server, which is a part of Serepo and, and where SRW is pre-installed for you. And then you can uh, get out of the GUI, go to the Jupyter server and start working on the command line or, or in a Jupyter notebook if you want to. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll give you a second to check your chat and then I'll ask you another question while we're at it. Okay. Uh, this next question coming in is, does the brilliance peak change with the energy detuning because of a finite energy acceptance or because of a finite transverse acceptance of the observation window? <laughs> um, okay. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I was I was looking at the chat. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. I put that in your chat as well because it's kind of a, uh, a long uh, question. So oh, is this the, does the brilliance peak change yes. with energy detuning? Okay, because of a finite energy acceptance or because of a finite transverse acceptance of the observation window. So it's not it's not due. Well, let's see. I, I think the answer. I don't think it's either of those things. Um, it's not to do, um, well, is it due to the, ex the observation window? I don't think so. Uh, let's see, are we specifying an observation window here? Uh, can you still see my screen? Yes, we can see you. Okay. Um, yeah, no, so there's no, there's no observation window being specified here. I mean, really it's, it's an intrinsic property of how the how the synchrotron radiation is is occurring um, that um, you know there's just there's just more flow you know the 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 resonant energy is a linear calculation right that's just really um, uh, looking at the resonance. Uh, between associated with the, the electron beam of a given energy and the, un, the wavelength of the undulator and so on. It, it's really just a linear calculation. And then you, you get this spectral shape and that's just an intrinsic property of the synchrotron radiation. And it just turns out that a lot of people, you know, maybe get fixated on that linear calculation of the resonant energy, but in fact, it's at an energy slightly below that where, where you get more photons. So. I, I don't know. I hope that explained it, um, but it's it's really not due to any kind of energy spread or aperture size or anything like that. All right, thank you. Um, the last question has to do with where they can get the slides and recorded presentation. I will be sending you an email update after this webinar that, excuse me, that has a link to our YouTube channel where you can find those options after I get them posted in a day or two. And that's uh, what we got. That is all of our time for today. So thank you again to Dr. Brewweiler for the presentation. Thanks for showing up to our webinar and we hope we'll see you again here soon. Have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye everybody.